right? When you actually have um, a particular geographical location identified, right? Um, you can actually mention, um, like, show a map, right, on the with the continents, with the maps, and and there are so many ways to look for a map. You know, if, even if you just type this particular family geographical distribution uh, a range map family range map, right? You will actually get so many examples for that. Um, and then economic importance, the family you picked, are they used for a sort of a food, right? Are they, do they make a nice pet animal, right? Are they um, used in research, laboratory research, right? Or are they actually um, a pest, medically important pest, agricultural pest, things like that. Now, all of these are actually explained in this um, PDF itself, right? And any other uh, fun fact, right? So those are the stuff you are supposed to research on your own. Natural history. Natural history might be a new word for you guys. Um, that actually refers to any interesting environmental ecological aspect about the family you picked, right? What habitats that the members of the family occupy? Um, what diet do they use? Um, what is their metabolism, right? What is their reproductive um, activities look like? How do they reproduce in every season? Do they reproduce only in certain times? So, so those are the basic uh, stuff that you want to research. And what is their behavior, right? Uh, is that a unique form of behavior, unique to a particular member of that family? Or are there any behavioral aspects that characterizes the entire family? Okay, now again, what I want you to do is as a group or as an as individuals, I want you to go over this um, instruction set and ask me any questions um, for clarification from this point onwards, right? If you don't understand, you know, if there are questions, you know, like that's fine, right? Keep asking them as we go today or in future. Um, and then, of course, you are doing a lot of research, right? You are researching information from the web. So you will have to have certain set of references, right? So, so we have acceptable references, right? Not a whole lot. We require, what, four acceptable references. Um, and then any additional references that we also accept, right? You, we, um, can also be added. What should not be used is things like Wikipedia, right? It should. It is no acceptable or additional um, references, right? Um, how many of you have so far read research articles from journals? Uh, give me a shout if you have. Oh yeah, yeah. No, 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 no surprise there. I, I see uh, several hands going up. If you are not, we are. We are starting it. Um, and then there will be, you know, this is a, uh, an easy assignment. So because of that, it actually carries a substantial grade. Okay. So there are two major parts, right? The actual presentation of the poster will happen at the end of the semester, last week, day of last day of the lab. Um, that will happen through Zoom, right? Where your groups will present the poster, right? Where you will be sharing. Like, like today I am presenting, you will be sharing your screens with me right, and uh, presenting that particular poster over the screen. Unlike in the previous years, you are not printing your poster, okay? You are not printing your poster. Please don't waste your money printing a poster, right? You are going to keep it electronically as a PDF, as a uh, PowerPoint file, and you will present that through screen sharing, just like this. Um, and so before that, you, just to make sure you guys are actually on track, you will do, you will submit a midterm status update report, right? And it's, it carries small percentage point, right? Nine points, 15% in writing as a Word document. And that will actually include your uh, linear classification, you know, going from domain all the way to the last level, that is a family level that you're stopping at, right? And then you will identify um, the total number of genera, this is not listing all the genera you have in that particular family. This is the total number of genera that you are going to find um, that, that you found through your research, right? And then just give um, one example, one example for a genus, right? Um, and then list just four features, four unique features for that particular family, and then list three closely related other families 
um, that you found in the phylogenetic tree, right? So those are the only four items that I want to see in your status update, right? Now status up update, please use the stated update. Um, please use the stated, uh, oh gosh, I cannot speak today, sorry. <laughs> use the status update to ask questions from me, right? Um, regarding, hey, prof, am I doing this right? You know, I don't get this one correctly. Like, so I'm not going to penalize for mistakes. Right. I, the, I will grade it, right? It's not free nine points. I will grade rather to your effort, but I also wanted to make sure that you are doing something, uh, um, everything correctly over here. For example, I do find the biggest mistake students make is listing four features. So rather than listing unique features, I find students listing features that are like common to other groups, right? Other families, right? Or that I far too unique, um, to a single member of that family, not characterizing the entire family. So those are the basic common mistake I keep finding, right? But again, do I take like 50 points off? No, I, I'll take, a, I'll knock off like a half a point or a point off, right? For a simple mistake. So here I'm trying to see whether you have invested enough energy, enough time um, to boost your early phase of the research. So start immediately, right? Because you are working uh, remotely, you guys don't get to meet in person. So do start working as soon as possible so that I can actually start helping you out as early as possible too. Um, so finally, ultimately what you do is you will actually produce the actual poster and now you may wonder, oh, wait, wait, am I supposed to come up with my own poster layout? Am I supposed to come up with my own um, um, poster design? No, we have already designed the template for you, right? If you go back to my Blackboard, right? Um, the first link poster template is actually the template for the poster that you are supposed to work on. So all you have to do is, you know, like it looks like this, Everybody give me a yay or nay. Um, are, are you looking at the, the PowerPoint slide that I'm sure that? that... Yeah. Yeah, thank you. So um, this is actually already done for you, right? All you have to do is download this, save it on your um, local computer or on one of the shared um, Google drives that you create. Take out things that are not necessary. For example, you might not work on cats. So delete those cat figure photographs, cat map and put whatever the correct thing in place of that. So it's simply deleting and pasting new stuff, right? Do not even, do not worry about adding any new boxes. All the boxes you need, all the information subheadings you need are already there, right? You will have to change the tree, right? The tree branching pattern will be different, right? Uh, the the trait labeling will be different, but, but uh, the basic layout is just keep this as it is, right? Don't even bother about like rearranging it, right? You know, that's too much work. Um, this is to help you out, right? Um, okay, okay, let's go back to my PDF over here. Okay, so the poster presentation will have an oral component where you narrate uh, what's on your poster, right? And then um, that will actually, uh, uh, the, the actual poster itself, 40% of your poster grade, um, the verbal presentation, 25%, right? And then two types of peer reviews. One, in each group, you guys peer review um, the members of your own group, right? And secondarily, you guys peer review um, other posters, right? So that's actually the two type of peer reviews you do, right? So your own members. So in that case, you actually even quantify how uh, involved other members are. Uh, second one, you are just like me. You assess other students based on how well they presented their poster, right? And I will provide you with um, rubrics, you know, to fill out when those, po that, that is due, right? That peer review is due on the same day as poster presentation. Right. And all of that ultimately will go into your final poster grade. And that final poster grade is a big part of your lab grade. Are we good so far, guys? Any questions? I do have a quick question. Shoot, yeah. Um, so the project, is it group project? Like, will each group have one poster? 
Correct. It's a group okay. project. You're right. And each each group will present a single poster. It's not each member of the group presenting a separate poster. No. Right. You will have three to four members in a group and you will present one poster. OK, thank Got you. Got it. Yeah. So have, um, alrighty. I have one more question. Uh, yeah, go ahead. We're we supposed to meet outside of class or supposed to use class time sometimes or. Yeah. So it depends on what we do in the class time. It's like I mean, after this, there will be plenty of class time left for you to discuss as well. Um, but I encourage in my past experience, my our students met outside the classroom, right? So what they did is actually they created like a Google Drive to share information, to upload uh, research information they find, to upload, to keep a copy of that uh, poster template post a template and then what mostly they did is actually rather than continuously meeting they actually do, did a division of labor hey you take care of the tree right i'll take care of natural history you take care of economical importance like that they subdivided they did a division of labor based on the topics i just went over right they looked at these topics right and um they did the subdivision. Let's say like, uh, hey, Kayla, you take up taxonomy. And then um, uh, Jared, you are going to do evolutionary trees. Randolph, you are going to do uh, representative genera. Like that, they did a division of labor, right? And and in that way, they met less frequently. Um, they mostly communicated in person uh, through email, right? And, and, and the other way is actually you can also um, communicate via text. So you can actually exchange your texts, uh, exchange your emails by the end of the day. So that's actually the best way to do that. Um, and I will also leave the Zoom link live once I finish today's lab so that you can actually continue conversations after the fact. Um, and also you can create your own Zoom or other form of communication channels, right? So answering Emily's question, if required, you will be able to, you're more than welcome to meet outside the classroom. Right, but um, the best way to go is assign a division of labor by first meeting or by email exchange, and then uh, keep working on your own. Have a meeting only if necessary, right? Um, and and keep going on like that, right? Did, did that answer your question, Emily? Yeah. All righty. And okay, I'm going up, 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 up. Post construction. So no printing. This instruction is when we are doing this in person, right? Um. And the citations will follow CSC format. And this one explains exactly how to do the CSC format. Um, yeah, so all the details regarding the poster construction, uh, the, you know, the, the project assignment, the details we expect, the point distribution, everything is here, right? And the, the mid semester status update is actually already included in the syllabus. Um, if you look at over here, right, submit family preliminary information, right? That is actually um, March 4th is kind of the deadline for that. That is immediately the week before your first lab practical, right? So keep that deadline in your mind. This is when this, the midterm update is due, right? And you will submit that through Blackboard, right? Um, let me show you really quickly where to uh, submit that. Right, you go to course content in your Blackboard page, and then you go to yada 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 yada. Um, all homework and assignments, and then this one family pre preliminary information, right? Midterm status update. That's where you submit it again. Um, is every member submitting something? No, one person from each group will submit their status update. Right. And then, of course, when you have poster prepared, one poster from each group will go, go in over there, right? Uh, peer assessment, yes, individual student will, uh, will upload peer assessments. Um, and again, when you submit your poster presentation, as well as your preliminary information, please do make sure to include all members' name on the poster, as well as on the status update. All righty. Um, And the, the very next thing I want to go over is a couple of additional um, insights 
for you guys to follow through, right? Um, right about the project presentation, right? So do start as early as possible, right? Um, because it takes time and you guys are already busy. Create a Google folder or a Microsoft um, Cloud folder and share it among all the members of your group. Um, and everyone in the group is going to be responsible for um, the information, right? So for example, you know, like if one of you were to drop out, we have all 10 members, we don't have, we haven't lost anybody. So if um, a student were to drop out from the class, if they're not responding, yes, then of course regroup, you know, redistribute the uh, division of labor, right? Um, and if I notice someone missing, I will let you know, right? Usually I do find it faster than you guys do. So make sure that you have all the members communicating properly. Um, it's always beneficial if you were to designate a leader, right? Because the leader can then actually, you know, reach out to me regarding questions you have or any problems you encounter, right? And yeah, do a divvy up, divvy up the work, right? And um, and the one, once the groups are assigned, um, you will, I ask you to remain in that group, right? Do not switch group because it's difficult to, it's, it's going to create complications. So stay in the group, right? Um, so, Wikipedia is should not be a good source, but it's a good starting place, right? Because Wikipedia lists a lot of references, a lot of primary literature, a lot of books, right? A lot of photograph, uh, information on uh, evolutionary trees. It, it is an excellent source to start, but should not be the ultimate resource. Um, When you are searching for trees, students keep uh, saying like, hey, prof, I cannot find a tree, so I'm, so the best way to find a tree is something like that. The, type your family's name and then type phylogeny. Type your family's name, type evolutionary tree. Or uh, type your family's name and then type phylogenetic tree, right? In that way, you can actually directly access the tree. Now, you might find multiple trees for the family you are picking up. Um, so which one are you going to present? Are you going to present all of them? No, pick one. How do I pick the best one? Um, the most recent one, right? If you read the um, the web page, you know, or the publication, you know, when was that paper published? When the when the website was last updated? Which um, phylogenetic tree is more uh, appear to be more correct for you based on um, you know the knowledge you already have, such as you know, like which one does not include traits that are based on homoplasy? which one uses molecular evidence as opposed to non-molecular evidence. Like that, you can actually use different line of evidence um, to pick the correct tree, right? Or the most accurate tree. Again, do not waste too, too much time picking the correct tree, right? Uh, you can also reach out to me when you're struggling on that, right? Um, Google Scholar is a great starting point. The university library resources are a great starting point. Um, if you have an animal example, animal diversity web is a terrific starting point, right? Um, natural history museums, they have online platforms. They are a great starting point um, to do, or, or even like a good critical resource to go to, uh, to dig out information, right? Um, and also remember that the interlibrary loan is actually a uh, free resource available to you. So if a particular uh, article is not available to you, right, um, you can always contact the library. There are lots of library support personnel that will help you to gather that article. Interlibrary loan, again, if you don't know, you can ask me down the road um, how to, uh, place a request. It's online, it's super easy. Usually in my experience, when I place, if I were to place a request tonight, by tomorrow early in the morning, I get the article as a PDF to my account, right? So I'm not going to spend time on going over how to do a Google Scholar, how to do an interlibrary loan, but uh, if that is something you want me to go over, ask me down the road, I will help you out, right? Because I suspect that some of you already know how to do that. Um, so when you create the poster, like in the template, use bullet points rather than writing complete paragraphs or sentences. If you try to do that, you will run out of space, right? So um, use your poster like the way I use this PowerPoint presentation. Have bullet forms and then elaborate on the bullet points on your own, right? You can keep your own personal notes, 
right? Index cards, flash cards um, for you to trigger your memory. Do not try to read things directly, literally out of the poster because that will impair your presentation grade. Okay. Um, and if you want to add other stuff on top of the poster, like a short video to sh uh, demonstrate a particular behavior of an animal, uh, additional images to show that you could not include in the poster itself, right? Um, or any additional diagram you want to show that you could not show in the poster, you can add other material. You can actually show things like that. You can add like a video or another uh, a diagram and sh share it with us while you do the presentation, right? So that's something you can do, not something you are required to do. Right. Um, so anything like that, just let me know ahead of the time so that, you know, I will know that I, so that I'm informed that I'm expecting additional information that you are going to share. Right. And if you do that, I will consider those additional stuff into your um, final poster grade. Um, so like I mentioned, do not try to rearrange the contents. Use the template as is. Um, the font size, font color, all of them keep them as it is. Right. Um, like again, do not overfill the information, right? Do not like, you know, um, put paragraphs over there. Um, and you're presenting a poster through um, Zoom. You are not presenting a PowerPoint presentation. So don't have multiple slides, right? Just you're going to have a single slide over here. And well, my personal experience, at least when I was teaching this in person, you know, this is fun. Right. This is actually something where you learn a lot of uh, fun stuff, particularly those who love animals, plants, and you have an ecological um, mind, environmental mind. This is a really fun activity you can do. And things we, the families we picked, there's lots of information out there. Not too much information, not without information either. Right. So now what we are going to do is I'm going to assign you guys into groups. Um, so just, since there is no, I don't see a preference and since you guys don't remember your initial membership, um, I am going to break you guys into groups myself, okay? So um, I'm going to read out names as it appears over here and that will make up um, your groups. Ready? Any questions so far before I may, uh, cut you into groups? All righty. So um, what I will do is just to randomize this process, I will um, create breakout groups where each of you will be divided into um, into uh, groups where you have three or four members in each group and it will be automatic. So please do spend like, um, three, four, about five minutes exchanging your email addresses and phone numbers, right? Um, and then I'm going to, while you do that, I'm going to drop into different um, breakout groups and let you pick a particular number, right? And each number will correspond to a particular family. Then I will give assign you that particular uh, family name. Okay, understood how it is going to happen? Alrighty, let's do this.
are you guys doing? Holding up okay? Hanging in yeah. there? Yeah. All right. Okay, guys. Um. Oh, let's go back to today's lab activity. Um. So first I'm going to present background information, right? And then I'm going to, um, let me actually start sharing screen. Share screen, right? Um, and then um, what I'm going to do is, ah, come on, give me one second. And then what I'm going to do is I will um, go over the specific exercise that you're supposed to follow on your own today. And then um, I will also explain the homework component. That's kind of how we should be uh, following this true. And now remember from this point onwards to whatever the notes I explain, don't take notes anywhere else, directly incorporate them into lab notebook, right? So um, your lab manual, Right, which is actually also available through Blackboard, ha should have um, does contain the information regarding how to maintain your lab uh, notebook, right, electronically or physically, like as a hard copy. Um, make sure whatever the notes I explain should go there. Start jotting it down as I uh, continue on. Right now, um, and also that's one point, right? And your lab notebook will be graded at the end of the semester uh, by the end of uh, your practicals. Second point, everything I explain. Um, through this intro lab will be helpful to complete the homework. Also will help you when you continue on the lab exercise on your own, right? So do make sure to uh, take notes, right? Um, alrighty, let's start this, right? So, uh, First animal kingdom that we are going to follow through is ectodosomans. And so before that, what is an animal? All animals are eukaryotes. And all an animals are also, um, and again, guys, when I, uh, since I, when I'm doing the presentation, unless you have a question, can I ask others to uh, cut, yeah, uh, you know, silent their mics? Because otherwise I start getting um, sort of a feedback. Alrighty. So uh, all animals are eukaryotes, right? They actually have a good cellular organization. They have uh, organelles, they have a nucleus. Yeah. And then heterotrophic, right? Animals cannot make their own food. So they have to rely on external um, supply of food, right? By eating other animals or eating plants. Multicellular, all animals have more than one cell in their body, right? They do not have cell walls, unlike plants or uh, unlike uh, fungi. Animals do have mitochondria, right? So we'll compare those features to other kingdoms. Um, animals are not the only eukaryotes. Plants, fungi, protists are all eukaryotes, right? And then, um, well, every, everything except a bacteria or an archaea or a virus are actually um, eukaryotic. Um, heterotrophy is also not just limited to animals. Fungi, pro other, there are other, so many protists some archaea and some bacteria are also heterotrophic. They cannot photosynthesize or they cannot chemosynthesize. Multicellular, well, plants, many fungi and certain protists, algae are multicellular, right? Um, lack of cell wall is also characteristic to many protists, right? And mitochondria is also observed in all other eukaryotes. Right. There are few eukaryotes that have secondarily lost it because of their simplicity, but um, so th but there are so many eukaryotes that actually have mitochondria as their cellular powerhouse. Um, moving on, looking at the evolutionary tree, the red circle, the yellow circle. Um, right. Can you see my uh, laser pointer, guys? Give me a nod. Yes, thank you. That's actually the um, ichnodosomal group, right? The yellow. Um, highlighted part. And then you can see in the phylogenetic tree where they come from, right? They actually, uh, so ones have two groups, two subgroups, nematodes 
and arthropods. Nematodes are parasitic worms, largely parasitic worms. Arthropods include insects, those creepy crawly guys, right? And what is a characteristic feature to all uh, ectodosoans? Well, if you look at this character trait E over here, ecdysis, meaning they actually shed their outer skin in order to grow. They shed, they um, um, mold, right? Their exoskeleton, so their outer covering when they are growing. Well, that's actually, you know, one of the most important character um, that I want you to know. Ectidozoan means actually animals that grow by shedding their skin. Right? And then you can actually read down the phylogenetic tree, right? Right over here, between the common sense, common ancestor for <coughs> between the common ancestor to ectodozoans and lophotrogozoans, right? You actually have a, something common between those two. That is actually the protostome, meaning during the embryonic development, the very first opening in the embryo becomes the mouth. And if you move further down over here, right? Um, Bilateral symmetry, triploblasty, is characteristics to right all of these animals, right? So, like that, you can actually read down the phylogenetic tree and understand um, what characters evolved where in this particular group of animals, right? So, the, right now, for today, the most important part I want you to know is all of them are protostomes, and all the ectodosoans are do undergo ecdysis, uh, meaning growing through repeated molting, multiple molting throughout their lifetime, right? So um, what kind of characteristics are we going to talk about them? Well, they are all bilateral or symmetrical. It's a character that they inherited from their ancestors. They, uh, uh, another character they inherited from their ancestors is that they have three germinal layers, ectoderm to the outside, endoderm to the inside, and then mesoderm in between. Um, and they have a tough exoskeleton, right? And, and they, they have to shed that exoskeleton when they grow, which is actually the most important feature, includes nematodes and arthropods. And this is one of the most diverse clades in the entire animal kingdom, right? Um, and now let's go over some nematode examples. Again, guys, if you have a question, you do have to speak up, you know, like uh, turn on your mic and speak up, right? Phylum nematoda, right? They are also known as roundworms, right? Now, again, speaking of that, uh, in your exams, right? Um, unless I specifically ask to list the, like, you know, the actual phylum name, roundworms is something I accept as a correct answer, right? If I ask for name the actual phylum name, but you were to give round, uh, if, but you were to give um, roundworms as the example, as the answer, you will still get partial credits. So do know both the English vernacular name and the scientific uh, terminology. They all are pseudo coelomates. Pseudo means false. Coelom is a body cavity. They have a body cavity, a zelom based body cavity, but it is not analogous to the actual zelom. The reason is pseudo zelom, right? As you see in this image, right? This is a zelom, right? That or the pseudo zelom. It's surrounded on one side by the mesoderm, on the other side by the endoderm. An actual zelom is completely surrounded by the mesoderm. Okay, that is why this is a pseudocelo. Nematodes do not have segmentation. They have like one complete body that does not divide themselves up into segments. Um, and they do have a cuticle. Remember, they have to shed something, right? So they it is the cuticle that these guys shed as they grow, right? Um, and the cuticle you can see in this particular um microscopic image, right? The, the black line on the top of the animal, that is actually their cuticle. Um, they have complete digestive tracts, right? Starts with the mouse, ends with the anus. Um, so the food direction is, you know, food flow is unidirectional, right? So they produce waste and then they poop out the waste. Um, they have a hydrostatic skeleton. Why? How so? Well, because they have a pseudocelome. If they have a coelom like thing, they should have the functionality of hydrostatic skeleton, right? So they actually can, with that, maintain their body shape, right? Males and females are separate, right? They are, they are on separate uh, individual worms. They, 
other than the digestive system, they don't have respiratory tracts or circulatory systems. Respiration and circulation happens directly by exchanging gases and material through the body covering, right? So it's simple diffusion that helps to redistribute stuff, right? No circulatory system, no respiratory system. So, um, so on your own, do go over and try to understand the different um, reproductive systems. They have another well-developed system they have, these worms have, is actually reproductive systems, right? Other than the digestive system. And reproductive system, by the way, is extremely elaborate in these guys, right? And sexes are separate. And male and female can be distinguished externally, right? Um, males are usually smaller, females are usually bigger, Males towards their anus, they actually have two spicules, two protrusions, two kind of spine-like things that is protruding out. In females, they don't have anything like that. They have this kind of a tapering, long structure, but they don't have anything like protruding out. Right, now to arthropods. These guys also have an exoskeleton. It's a chitinous exoskeleton, right? Um, they also have paired appendage, things that they have on either side of their body. The functions of those appendage could be sensory, like antennae, feeding, like mouthparts of uh, insects or mouthparts of a crayfish, locomotion, the walking legs of a spider, reproduction, organs that certain uh, arthropods have for the purpose of copulation, right? Um, defense, close of a crayfish. Um, circulatory system is open. That's extremely important to uh, know, right? And if they have an open circulatory system, you should logically think, okay, so the blood or the hemolymph, the blood version of them should um, drain into some sort of an open space. And that open space is called hemocele, right? Now you can ask the question again using the logic. Okay, great, open circulatory system, I know they have some sort of a open cavity where blood or um, hemolymph drains to, which is called hemocele. So if, the, if that's another body cavity, okay, that's a, so these, all of them should be coelomic, meaning they should actually have some sort of another body cavity, coelom or a coelom-like body cavity. So what happens to the coelom in arthropods? Do they have them? Adults may not have a coelom, right? Larval stages might have a coelom, right? But in certain adults, they could, the coelom could be reduced. So do they have a coelom? They could. That coelom could be present any life stage. May, maybe not in adults, but in larval stages, right? Maybe in embryonic stages, maybe in the egg, right? But if adults have a coelom, that's going to be extremely small, extremely reduced. It's kind of giving away to hemolymph. Hemolymph is taken up some of the functions of the coelom. That's why it is happening. Well-developed sense organs, right? Um, actually extremely well-developed eyes, extremely well-developed chemoreception. Um, the diversity is astounding. Over 1 million known species, maybe another 10 million that we don't even know of, right? Um, so I did mention about the fate of the coelom, right? Coelom is present, but it is reduced or absent in adults. Many arthropods undergo metamorphosis, right? Meaning they actually, there is a um, shift between their juvenile and adult forms, right? When they sexually mature, they develop a completely different morphology and they could even inhabit completely different habitat. Another really interesting feature observed in arthropods, right? Um, I have a question real quick. Yes, of course, shoot. Uh, what, what's the easy way to remember what a coelom is? What's an easy way to remember what a coelom is? Is actually understanding that the fact that the coelom is a body cavity, right? And a body cavity that actually, and then think about what a body cavity or a coelom is supposed to do, right? Coelom is supposed to A, provide, you know, like create hydrostatic function. If it is a cavity, cavity should be filled with something. Usually coeloms are filled with a coelomic fluid. A cavity filled with fluid can generate pressure to maintain the shape, right? So that's another way to remember what it does. And another way to remember is if you have a cavity filled with fluid that can change the shape or maintain the shape that also, if it is generating hydrostatic force, hydrostatic force can also create movements. 
that's another important thing to remember uh, with related to um, Celom. Now, just an additional feature uh, that I wanted to mention. This is not related to the lab. This is related to uh, Randall's question. My lecture part is also available to all the students through YouTube, right? So if you follow that channel of mine, you should be able to get more information about like these theoretical parts. In lecture, I go into very details about this, but for lab, I actually, um, only highlight the more important part. So you can ask a question or you can actually just follow up my lecture if you need that kind of additional information, right? Okay. So coelom diagram, this is just for you to understand the differences between a non coelomic animal like a flatworm versus um, pseudocelomic animal like um, the nematode and a true coelomic animal, right? So look at how it changes. No body cavity is coelomic, right? Um, have a body cavity, but it's not completely surrounded by um, mesoderm, right? Like in this case, pseudocelomic. Ha contains a body cavity that is completely surrounded by um, mesoderm is a true coelomic animal, okay? So the function of that is actually to help movements, to create hydrostatic skeleton, which helps movement, which helps maintaining body shape. Um, and also it kind of, many body organs are kind of embedded in this fluid. Remember what I mentioned about diffusion-based um, nutrient redistribution, uh, gaseous exchange? Well, if that were to happen, right, organs should be suspended in a fluid. So, so now you know where exactly, right? In certain cases, it's in the coelomic fluid. In other cases, it's in the hemolymph, right? So there you go. Um, so again, another theoretical part that I want you to understand, open circulation versus closed circulation. Who has an open circulation? Arthropods, right? Closed circulation, we will go through those examples later on. What does that mean is in a closed circulation, blood always flows through vessels or chambers, right? Like you see over here, right? Um, over here. In an open circulation system, blood does not always flow through tubes and chambers. It could get into an open chamber, right? So the blood, quote unquote blood, in arthropods, we call that hemolymph, right? And um, it gets into an open space, right? Like hemocele or into a sinus, into something like that, right? So that's actually the difference between open circulation and a closed circulation. What do you think we have, guys, as vertebrates or as chordates? Open circulation or a closed circulation? Closed. Closed circulation, correct. Now, there are several groups in the phylum. Arthropoda, um, Chelicerata, that's crabs, shrimps, crayfish, um, Myriopoda, right? Um, hexapoda and crustacea. And let me actually go to the examples in this slide, right? Chelicerata, I mentioned the examples. Um, sorry, Chelicerata examples are not crayfish. I lied. Spiders, scorpions, ticks, mites, um, sea spiders, right? So those are actually the Chelicerates, right? Spiders, scorpions, ticks, mites, sea spiders. Myriopoda, uh, myri means multiple, millipedes, having multiple legs, right? Uh, is my Myriopoda is having multiple legs, so millipedes. Centipedes are the example, right? Now, chelicerata, chelicerae means like close, right? Having closed organs is what chelicerata means. Hexapoda, having hex means six. Poda means limbs, six hexapoda, six legged creatures, insects largely, right? Crustacea, right? Sort of crusted animals having a thick crust on them. Crabs, barnacles, copepods, lobsters, shrimps, all the other cool stuff that you find, right? And, and they are largely, largely aquatic, right? Um, Chelicerates could be, are largely terrestrial, overwhelmingly terrestrial. Myriopods, overwhelmingly terrestrial. Hexapods, um, some of them are aquatic, some of them are terrestrial. Crustaceans, overwhelmingly marine, and some of them are freshwater. Right, so that's actually end of the background lecture. Again, guys, everything we, I'm talking about today, I am recording it, and then I'm uploading a link to um, Blackboard through YouTube, okay? Any questions regarding, regarding the background before we jump on to the actual lab exercise? 
very, very good. Let's go on with today's lab exercise, right? Uh, and again, all the PowerPoints are also available already through Blackboard under the folder uh, named after today's lab. So before you, when you start the lab, right, go through the lab manual, right? And I will go through the lab manual with you as I uh, continue this, right? And then um, I will highlight which parts you can do, how to do that part, and which parts you cannot do because you are me meeting in person, right? Largely, you it's very intuitive which part you can do, but do uh, go through the lab manual. If you have the physical lab manual with you, great. If not, um, the lab manual is also uploaded to Blackboard. So first exercise is going through a dichotomous key. Uh, give me a shout or raise of hands if you already know what a dichotomous key is or have done this before. Yeah, well, uh, just a few of you. Most of you may not, that's okay. So dichotomous key uh, is something like this. Right? So like what you do is you take a particular animal, right? Um, example animals I have given you, right? And if you navigate to the next slide, you will see one, two, three, four, five animals, right? So what you will do is you will go one animal at a time and then try to key them through this particular list, right? The first, you take the first animal. Let's look at our first animal over here, that guy, right? Hmm, looks like a crab, okay? And I have provided some uh, guidance. Things that since you cannot touch it, I'm actually you know providing some details on the slide. That's an abdomen. If you look at um, this particular structure, that's the abdomen. And I say that this animal has a hard shell. So let's go back and try to key this animal, right? And, and you can turn on your mics now because I'm going to ask questions. First thing, animal covered by hard shell or exoskeleton. What do you guys think? O and A, B is actually animal soft body. Is it A or B for this guy? A. A. Oh, everybody says A. Yes, animal covered by a hard shell. Yeah, because I say so too. And of course you guys know crabs, right? They're hard, right? Um, hard bodied. Two, body segmented with separation between cephalothorax and abdomen legs attach only to the cephalothorax, B, body with repeated segments, each bearing two pair of legs. Hmm. Let's look at this guy. Well, this is abdomen. So this is actually cephalothorax. They have legs. All of them seem to um, connected to cephalothorax, right? Yeah, it's not connected to abdomen. Abdomen is folded on to the underneath of the cephalothorax. So which one would you say? 2A or 2B? 2A. Yeah, everybody says 2A, you are correct. So 2A says go to three, let's go to three and read it out. Abdomen is folded under cephalothorax. Spoiler alert. <laughs> Abdomen is horizontal to the cephalothorax. What, do you, what does it look like? Oh, what did I just say a second ago? A. Yeah, abdomen is folded under the cephalothorax. So, so that animal is Cancer irratus, right? Cancer irratus. Cancer is a genus name for many crabs, right? So that, so that's actually, um, is a, is your identification for the animal one, right? So in your lab uh, notebook, this is a, you can just record animal one is actually um going to be that guy, Cancer Eratorex. And just for you to know, right, I actually listed the English name and the scientific name over here because the key will take you to the scientific name and I have provided the English name over here for you, right? Um, does it make sense how to uh, do the key? Right, so you start from number one, read A or B, and then go to whatever it takes you to, whatever you it takes to, you to until you end up with a particular animal. Right. Um, everybody comfortable with keying in? Perfect. Right. And again, remember, guys, next week when we meet, you will have time to ask questions regarding wherever you stuck before you submit your homework. Right. OK, let's go past that. And, and always remember, read the features I listed over there. Right. 
read the features I listed over there before you key in. Look at the animal, read the features you list uh, that I have listed. Um, exercise two, root nematode observation. So since I cannot in person show you what this is, I have provided the YouTube link. Just click the link and uh, observe it and also listen to the explanation in that video. Um, and then in your lab handout, we ask several questions. So you can actually, as you listen to the video based on what you learn out of that, um, you can write down uh, the answers to those questions, right? So, and there are really cool stuff about nematodes that I am impressed about, right? Um, first thing is like, when you hear the word nematodes, what, what do you think about? Raking parasites, right? That actually literally sucks your food out, right? <laughs> um, so they actually suck your blood, right? I mean, that's how they feed on you. Um, so, but are all nematodes parasitic? A mm, lot of nematodes are parasitic, but not all nematodes are parasitic. There are free living predatory parasites um, that are out there. Now, are all parasites animal parasitic? Are all parasitic nematodes are parasitizing animals? No, some of them are parasitic on plants. And the example you're looking at is actually a plant parasite, right? And so mostly they act, they're, they're, uh, the female, you are going to see almost always female-based populations, right? Or female-based samples. Um, and what you first see, right? You know, when you look at that particular video, if I were to actually show you a slide, you don't see the actual worm. What you see is actually these um, root nodes or nodules within which you actually see the nematode itself or nematode eggs, right? It's, it's really cool, right? And also most often you are going to see a female because male production is limited to um, the times when the plant is under stress, right? So um, it's kind of cool to think about it. So um, males actually do not have much functional role in the population and they are only produced when the plant is stressful. Think about it, when the plant is stressful, the plant cannot afford to have a parasite, right? The plant will die if they do. So that's why they produce males, just to continue their population, right? And, and, and they don't parasitize, they just live around, right? They feed on, like, you know, their, their um, mode of life is non-parasitic. And when the plant returns to good conditions, healthy conditions, right? It could be because the plant is stressed because of the drought. Then the female produce males only, right? And the males, keeps the progeny going on. And when the drought is over, when the plant is no longer stress, uh, the reproduction happens again and they produce now continues on with, you know, female majority lifestyle, right? Uh, switching from a male majority to female majority uh, population. So um, it's pretty cool, right? So the male's function is rather what? Just reproduce or just keep, you know, uh, keep the population alive or stay alive because girls cannot, uh, the girl, number of females are going to go down when, when the plant is under stress because the plant will not be able to sustain parasites. This is a good um, lesson to learn about parasites. Good parasites don't kill the host, right? Good parasite actually is so good, they, the, the host will not even notice they have been parasitized, right? That's actually a good character of a parasite. Um, the bad thing is what? you might actually live and die without knowing that you actually had parasites in you. <laughs> I don't know which one is good. <laughs> to get sick when you have parasites or not to get sick. Anyways, so now moving on to um, the crayfish part. Again, you know, when you, when you jump to the crayfish part, uh, make sure that you put, uh, you know, like start taking drawings on your drawings on your notebook. Um, and same here too, right? When you start making observations, feel free to uh, uh, start taking drawings, right? As you can post the video and make your drawing. And then over here, um, make sure to include stuff in your notebook and, and keep following the information as it elaborates on your lab manual. Um, and also keep answering the questions as you go down um, the lab manual. The things I explained in the intro slide or things that are already in the intro slide will be helpful to answer the question. And most importantly, from this point onwards, right, for all the dissections, you will be writing stuff A through G, right? So, and I will also repeatedly mention where you need A through G. So for the crayfish, do the A through G. 
food, right? The animal you are dissecting or look, watching a dissection over, what do they eat, right? Um, structures and processes that they use for food capture, right? How do they ingest stuff? What kind of you know body structures they use for that? Do they digest things internally or externally, right? Um, do they? How do they eliminate waste? Do they have an anus to eliminate waste like that? Describe the food uh, digestion component. Do they have a digestive system? If they do, is it complete or incomplete, right? And then the movement. How do they move? What structures do they uh, use for movement, right? And for this one, don't directly think about limbs. If there is a limb for a nematode, you are going to say, oh, they can't move. That's not true. Nematodes can move. They move through your gut. How? Can anyone tell me how a nematode moves? This is actually a good time to logically think. Is it by attaching to like tissue in your body? That's actually how they parasitize you, right? That's a good thing that you mentioned that that's connect to their parasitic lifestyle, attachment to the host tissues, biting onto the host tissues, having hooks to um, latch onto the host, that's related to the food acquisition. That is not related to digestion. Remember, uh, that is not related to movements. So Remember that, sorry, go on Randolph. Uh, do they move, uh, I was gonna say cilia, but. I, I didn't hear what you just said, I Randolph. Said cilia, but I don't think that's right. No, they don't have cilia. Okay. What do they have as a body cavity? Pseudocelum. Correct, pseudocelum, correct. So if you have a pseudocelum, what kind of a skeleton you can have? If you have a coelom or a pseudocelum, what kind of a skeleton you have? Hydrostatic. Hydrostatic skeleton. Can you use hydrostatic skeleton to move? You can. So that's how they move. In addition to that, in their body wall, they actually have longitudinal muscles, right? So just longitudinal muscles. So because of the longitudinal muscles, they can collectively longitudinal muscle contraction and the hydrostatic skeleton resulted by pseudocelum will help them to move, right? That's actually one example. So that's actually how I want you to elaborate. And that's how you think actually. Skeleton and the body structure, do they have a skeleton that helps them to maintain their body shape? What do you think? Yeah, Kayla is nodding. What, what are, like, do they have a skeleton? Well, uh... Yeah, Jared, go uh, say it. For the crayfish or for the ascaris? Oh, for what? I didn't say for what. For 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 um for both. Let's talk about that for both crayfish. Crayfish, yeah. Yeah. How about um the nematode? Yes. And which is uh, what? Pseudocelum. Yes, pseudocelum, right? <laughs> And the cuticle is also sort of functioning like a skeleton, right? Um, because muscles do attach to that particular uh, cuticle, right? And again, let's go back to movements. Can the crayfish move? Using yeah. what? Legs. They have walking legs. They also have swimming legs, right? And they also have a tail, right? So, so, so write all the related structures when you answer these questions. The more you write, not only that you get a good grade for your lab notebook, the better you do you in, in your exams, right? And better you do in your homework. Um, that's about movement, skeleton and body structure um, and other stuff are self-explanatory. I'm cherry picking stuff that it is hard to uh, understand. So think about other stuff, cephalization. Do you think formation of a clear head? Can you see a very clear cephalization in Ascaris in, in, the, in the nematode? Well, you can think like that. Well, mm, Ascaris has a head. I know, uh, well, they have a, a front end. A, um, they have a mouth, so which is actually the front end. Front end. So um, they kind of have a cephalization, but not the best form of cephalization. So you can actually mention, describe it. They do have a mouth, a clear front end, and a clear back end where they have the anus, but externally, cephalization is not that distinct. Right? So you like that you can explain. Yes. So the, the tail part, it curves, 
the head part does not curve. So here there are certain characters you can tell where's the head, where's the tail, but not that distinct, but there is some evidence of cephalization. Okay. I have a question. Yeah, go. Will this information go in like the lab, the lab itself? uh part of the notebook or the back of the notebook with the species good question these are the lab no like the actual required part right for every lab there is like a like a elaboration of the lab note section right and then there's an optional section these parts non optional these must go in there and you and if you read the lab manual these are part of the part, things that you have to fill as you go. Optional parts are the things I explained to you or that you learn on yourself that does not answer any of the questions in the lab manual. Okay. All righty. So, um, and then body structure. Yeah, there are body cavities. If there's a body cavity, what's the name of that? Are there two body cavities? Well, crayfishes have two body cavities. They have a zeolome, which is extremely reduced, and they have a hemoly. Uh, Hemocele, right? Okay. And well, then um, reproduction and development. Again, well, do they have reproductive organs? Do they have reproductive systems? Do you see males and females separate, right? Where does fertilization happen? Is it internal or is it external? Externally is when sperms and eggs fertilize in the medium, in water, right? Or outside. Internal is when male inserts sperms directly to the female's body. Right, um, and then offspring type offsprings do they have a larval stage um, where they actually undergo this indirect development, or do they have uh, do they not have a larval stage? Right, so crayfishes actually have a larval stage. Right, and then um, Ascaris, the nematode, also have multiple larval stages. So those are the things you can mention. Don't just say they have a larval stage. Say, do they have a single larval stage or multiple larval stages, right? Uh, respiration and, 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 and circulation. Well, again, now you immediately should know the nematode does not have any of those systems. But the, the crayfish has both systems and you can tell that it is an open system, right? So that's actually how you provide complete information. Other organ systems. Um, notes about anything that you want to mention, any other organ systems you want to elaborate over here, right? It, it could be as simple as saying, right? Uh, Ascaris does not have any other organ system aside from uh, reproductive organs and digestive systems, right? So that, that's also good information to write down. Phylum characteristics. I already went over the phylum characteristics. You can just simply copy, you know, list the same characters that I sh just shared with you, right? Um, so that's actually, what you do in terms of that A through G activity, right? And this will keep coming up uh, multiple times in every lab from this point onwards. Now, the next job is a observing Ascaris anatomy, right? So again, we have a YouTube video that explains the anatomy. So you first uh, watch the video and then read through the read the lab activity as you watch the video, right? And then um, make drawings whenever it's necessary. And then there are embedded questions in the lab exercise as you continue on. Um, and you will get to see both uh, male and female dissections. So you will actually have separate drawings for male and female. Word about drawing guys. I don't care how pretty your drawing is. I care how well it is labeled. I care how complete your drawing is, I do not care how pretty it looks, right? Um, so simple line diagrams is fine, right? Completely fine. Um, and yes, label all the features and, and also like make sure that, you know, you label what is the anterior, what is the posterior, right? And then, um, and then of course, what structures you can easily label. I have mentioned them down over there on the bottom of the slide. And also the lab manual also goes through those uh, same organs. Um, this is the same, uh, this is the diagrammatic labeling. First look at that so that you know what to look for, right? And then what I have done is actually on top of the video and everything, I, if you need further help, I have provided several labeled actual photographs. Right. This will help you to probably to when you're studying in your exams, um, rather than when you're doing the homework part. Right. So if 
the dissection video helps. Don't waste your time going over this now, right? But if you need more help to complete the homework assignment, when it comes to the exam, uh, do go over these label diagrams. So again, I'm providing multiple label diagrams, right? Um, so that actually you can see different wheels um, of the same thing. Yeah, we have, uh, someone has his uh, mic on. <laughs> Yeah. Who is that? Don't know if it was Randolph. Yeah. Hey, Randolph, we could hear you. <laughs> oh, you can hear me? Yeah, yes, yeah. Um, yeah, it's okay. Make sure to turn off the mic when you actually had to like, uh, you know, um, uh, go off. I was wondering like, so who was that? Anyways, no, no worries. Don't worry about that. So remember what I mentioned earlier, right? Uh, the curve part is actually the, 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 the anal end, right? The curved part is the kind of the anal end. The front end is actually more like uh, pointy, right? Pointy end, the cephalic end, right? Um, curved end, the clavicle or the anal end, right? Um, and again, I have provided separate photos for males and females, right? So what I have done over here is not extra work for you. This is actually pointing towards specific structures that I want you to know, right? The hole at the anterior end of the male. What do you think? The front end? What kind of a hole do you expect them to have? Now you can turn on your mics and answer me. Mouth. Correct, that would be mouth, right? And then, well, what should be here? Hooked posterior end. What is the term for the opening to release digestive waste and reproductive cells? What would be, that be? The common chamber, that's called cloaca, right? And then, not the anus, I'm not, oh, I'm asking collectively, what do you call that, right? The everything, so cloaca is a big chamber and opening where food, nitrogenous waste, and all the things that you want to get rid of gets there, including reproductive cells. Um, and then actually then again over here, we'll, we'll quickly go over these labels really quickly, right? The first one, sperms, um, Sperms are produced. What kind of a organ in male reproductive system produce sperms? Testes. Testes, correct. And then um, sperms then can be stored somewhere, right? It goes through a tube and stores somewhere. Where do you think we store sperms? Well, you might not know the answer, but if you, if you do know, shout it out. If I go, not the van yeah, go. Sorry? It's not the van defera civet. Vas deferens versus seminal vesicles, right? So vas deferens is actually um, the tube that connects testes with seminal vesicles. It is actually the seminal vesicles that stores sperms, right? And this particular coiled part is actually the vas deferenses uh, where the sperm's passage from testes to the storage. Okay, and this flat tube that extends the entire length of the body, what do you think that is? Digestive tract. That is correct. You can say digestive tract. You can also call it the intestine, okay? And then again, female system, I provided lots of label diagrams um, and the same thing, right? So, where do you think um, eggs are kept? This long, big structures where eggs are kept. Or oh, eggs are stored, not produced, uh, stored. Where would you think that is? If you look over here, maybe that might be a little bit helpful. Where do you think the eggs are stored? Not produced, stored. This long, large structures, that's called the uterus. Right, and then the eggs um, goes to uterus through a particular structure called. Anyone want to guess out of all of these labels things how eggs gets from ovary to the uterus? Uterus. 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 Uter
Uh, Are we there? Correct. I, I think uh, two people try to answer that question. That's correct, right? And then, yeah, I'm not going to go over all of them. Again, the same structures over there, right? And eggs are produced where? Any female animal produces eggs where? Ovaries. Ovaries, right? So again, like the things that over here are not extra work. It's actually kind of helping you to know certain structures better. These are the same questions you get to answer when you go through um, the lab manual, right? You are not required to like copy and paste these diagrams and answer them. This is purely a to help you study the most vital organs that I want you to know. When it comes to the practical, these are the ones I'm going to ask you, right? Hell, I might use the same images. <laughs> I will use the same, I, I might use the same images or very similar images, okay? Moving on, crayfish di dissection and crayfish ex inter external anatomy, right? Again, there are two separate videos, slowly go over the videos. This is better than actually me doing it in person. You can pause and uh, continue. Um, and you can, yeah, you go through the external structures, try to identify all the structures by yourself. Um, and then, and also remember my PowerPoint, you can actually, you know, like go by the, by PowerPoint slide by slide, this, this particular slide or switch between my background slide if you wanted to uh, make the connection, right? And then what specific structures should you be able to label? all of these external structures, right? And then all of these internal structures, you should be able to label after watching the video. Well, on top of that, okay, an example for the line diagram. Again, you know, this is just um, for you to give an idea, the best level I expect is something like this, right? That is the best level that I would expect, right? Again, don't try to make it any prettier, right? Um, and then this is kind of how you dissect this, right? Um, and un try to understand the planes, right? So the backside versus um, the front side of the animal, right? This particular front side, what do you call the front side? What is the name for that? The head end of an animal, what do you call it? Anterior. Correct, anterior or cephalic, both are correct. Right? And the rear end? Posterior. Posterior, right? Um, and then, yep, that's actually the only two things. So this part, right? The view we are looking at, at this crayfish, what do you call that view? Dorsal. Very good, dorsal view. And the opposite to dorsal? Ventral. Very good, ventral, excellent, right? Um, and again, it's actually the continuation of that. Like that, do answer the questions as you go on, right? Um, so let's do this just for a, a trial. Most posterior part of the uh, the animal, right? So this is actually, you're looking at, this is collectively the tail, right? So can somebody tell me what specifically this particular part is? You might not know right now, right? So collectively, this is called tail. Can anyone tell me specifically this particular part or that part? Cervix? Eh, no, but okay, let's wait for that one. Um, so um, yeah, collectively, you can call it tail, uh, uh, tail, tail, right? Um, these two are called Europod. The middle one is called Telson, right? And I, And don't try to write it down right now because that's a labeled image. What do you call this entire part? Thorax. The, uh, thorax, 50% correct. What else do you think you find in a crayfish? Thorax is connected with the head part and the head we call cephalic, right? So cephalic plus thorax, mm -hmm. head and thorax, cephalothorax, okay? So collectively, this region, head and thorax, is cephalothorax, right? And what would be this part then? What is the third part in any vertebra any any um, arthropod? What is the last part in their body? Abdomen. Very good, abdomen. Right. And then this is actually the label diagrams I was telling you about. See what I meant, right? Europod and telson collectively is called the tail, right? And the middle part 
is called the telson, right? The two parts on either side of the telson are called uropods. Again, I'm not going to like call out everything over here, but what I'm going to do is highlight that I want you to properly understand how men, how different appendages are spe specialized in a crayfish, right? The very front set are specialized for sensory functions, right? There are two pair of antennae. One is called antennae. The other pair is called antennule, right? Collectively, you can call both of them antennae, two pair of antennae, right? This part, right? And then you actually go into um, lots of other uh, sensory structures, right? That actually is there for tasting what they eat, right? Some of them are tactile, sensitive to touch. Some of them are chemoreceptors, sensitive to the taste. And then you have this large first pair of walking leg that are modified into pincers or claws, right? We call them chelipad. And then you have uh, one, two, three, four, uh, for five, five sets of walking legs. The first walking leg is close. Two, three, four, five are other walking legs that are actually used for walking. And then you actually have swimming legs called swimmerets, right? The first two pairs of the swimmerets in a male is modified into claspers. The purpose of those claspers are for reproduction, right? Uh, they actually inject sperms into the female's body. Right, and then of course you end up with the uh, the uropods. Remember, for locomotion, right? They can use walking legs, they can use swimmerets, they can use uropods, they can use telson, right? So all of those are helpful for swimming, right? For feeding, well, of course they can use these chelipeds, the first walking leg, for feeding purposes, for defensive purposes, right? And then again. I have this label diagrams just to assist you. Um, ambulation. What do you mean by ambula ambulation or ambulating in English? Walking. Walking. Very good. Walking. Right. Um, and then, like, what do you call this large modified first leg? Right. And then, what do you what I just just call these sensory structures that are actually literally like feelers that are sensitive to touch. Right. Um, and this one that actually separates the head part from the thorax part is called cervical groove, right? That's a term that you will find in your lab handout, right? Cervical groove, right? And then remember what I mentioned about this, the other sensory structures? There is actually mandibles, maxillae, maxillipeds, right? Mandibles are large structures right in the center, right? Long sort of leg-like structures are maxillae and maxillipad, right? Um, so the walking legs are also known as pereopods, right? And swimming legs are also known as pleopods. Again, this is not just to give you too many names. This is simply to introduce you to alternative names that you can use in your exams or in wherever you take notes. Gonopods are another pair of names for claspers that you found in males only that helps to inject sperms into the female system, right? And, um, and in females, they actually also use these pleopods or swim swimmerets to um, protect eggs. She actually carries eggs with her after fertilization, right? Um, okay, there are different diagrams labeled in different uh, levels um, in, in different orientations. So again, I have labeled every diagram that I want you to remember, right? I have a quick question. Yeah, yeah, shoot. The last, the last page showed like uh, chelipeds and chela. What is the difference? Okay, good question. What is the difference between a chelipede and a chela, right? Or a chela? So chelipede is the entire structure, right? From its attachment point all the way to the end of the claw is actually the chelipede, the entire leg, entire appendage. Kila or chela, I don't care how you pronounce it. Kila is the way I pronounce it. Is actually just the claw. Got it? Right. So good question, by the way. And um, yeah, then again, you know, go label this by go, try to identify this by yourself. Um, and again, over here, I'm asking this question. What sex is this? How do you identify? I told you how to identify male versus female 
round uh, ascaris how do you identify male versus female um crayfish anyone want to make a guess whether this is a girl or a boy color sorry so the color color does not help oh. actually so oh. remember what i mentioned Look for the gonopods maybe correct if they have gonopod those rigid structures right where the, the first set of swimming legs have become rigid structures that are help to insert um deliver sperms then you are looking at a male if you don't see any structures like that if you see this flimsy feather like swimming legs then you are looking at a female right that's how you know male versus female right um let me see. yeah yeah like that um let me see so here this is a male right look at this very strong rigid structures uh, modified swimming legs that are modified to deliver sperm right so this is a male and you don't have that over here and this is a female right see how broad and how well developed these swimming legs are to carry eggs in a female and see in a male those structures those swimming legs are not that well developed because they are only used for swimming right not for retaining stuff uh, to, to uh, protect eggs again this actually labels back the different uh, organs um, of the crayfish and it actually explains how they look like and this is the same one where i'm asking you to simply label them right so i, I put them back to back intentionally so that you know um how to identify structures and what kind of characteristics you use to identify them for example the mandibles are actually smaller and they look like like globes right um and then the mandible surrounds the mouth right that's another thing right i wanted to mention so and again um the stomach has two parts and you will see this two parted stomach coming up in other animals right uh the it is cardiac versus pyloric right um those are the two parts of the stomach that you want to uh, that i want you to understand and then we follow up with the um the internal structures right again this is these are the diagrams that um that you will see as a dice as the dissection proceeds right um and you know the two parts of the stomach right more anterior part versus more posterior part right and then um for example if you go back over mm, no here um so tube leading from the bony structure leading into the cardiac stomach what kind of a tube would you expect to lead to the stomach tube like organ what do you what do you have from mouth to stomach what do you call that esophagus esophagus right so the first part of the stomach is cardiac stomach and then over here i am asking the stomach nearest to the mouth what should it be right the two parts are cardiac and pyloric so the first part is cardiac cardiac yeah so think about it's like cardiac is like heart heart comes first right so like whatever closest to the heart is the what comes first so cardiac followed by pyloric um right and then of course um organs with holes for dispersing something um hemolymph into the hemocell what kind of an organ would actually pump hemocell into the hemolymph uh, hemolymph into the hemocell what kind of a thing actually would pump things anyways heart heart that's the heart right so like that i'm 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 just pointing you towards some of the correct answers right and there are holes on this heart right because without holes you cannot pump stuff from the rest of the circulation into the hemocell right and again uh different labeled diagrams of the interior anatomy uh, i provided so many diagrams so that you can a get to see different parts i want you to know right and if you see certain structures that i label but i don't emphasize in the beginning right over here 
If I don't emphasize it over here, it's not in the lab manual, but I label it anyways, forget it. You are not supposed to know that, right? Right. Um, the last part is actually um, going over the displays. So, so the displays, usually we provide them on the lab bench. So instead, we provide them as a picture and a YouTube video, right? Vinegris are really cool creatures, again, nematodes, right? They, uh, there are many of them in the sample they are looking at. Um, and then, um, of course, we have the slide, right? Which is actually the, the worm um, that observed under a cover, uh, under a, a microscope. And then a couple of questions related to them. Describe the movements of um, Terbetrix aceti, which is the, in, the scientific name for the vinegar worm, right? How is it limited? How are the muscles arranged to create this type of movement, right? Now, if you remember what I just mentioned at the very beginning of the lecture, um, what kind of, like in the video you will see too, right? The vinegar eels, eels actually move like kind of a pulsating movement. They, they kind of wiggle around, right? It's not swimming, it's not crawling. They kind of wiggle around here and there. Can you guess why are they sort of wiggling around? Why are they not like moving like an inchworm? Why, why do you think they're just like wiggling around? All their muscles are located close to their skin, so. They can't That's really move in a, I don't really know how to explain it. Actually, I think you are very close to the correct answer. One is actually they only have, well, one thing they, that help them to uh, move is pseudocelom, right? Pseudocelom will generate, create a pressure with um, hydrostatic skeleton, but you need to have a muscle system to, support, to kind of extract that pressure generated by the pseudocelom. So remember I said they only have one type of a muscle. I called it longitudinal muscles. So longitudinal muscles only contract one way, right? Contract, relaxes, contract, relaxes. So without round muscles or oblique muscles with other orientations, these guys cannot actually move like a earthworm or an inchworm. Right? So, because they only have one type of muscle that only contract on one way and relaxes on the opposite direction, they cannot produce coordinated movements. That's the simple answer, right? Um, and what kind of advantages you have when you have a harder skeleton, cuticle, what kind of disadvantages you can have? Well, advantage obviously is protection, right? Protection from external damage. Right? Disadvantage could be they cannot absorb food or complex material from their skin. You have to eat from their mouth, right? Those could be the disadvantages, right? Uh, another advantage, uh, so, so you can actually research and think about other advantages or disadvantages, right? Um, and maybe another advantage is, so I mentioned about longitudinal muscles, right? And the longitudinal muscles are attached to what? The cuticle? To cuticle. So the cuticle functions as a surface for muscle attachment. Remember earlier I mentioned that could be considered a skeleton or an exoskeleton, just like in the case of arthropods, right? Muscles attach to the exoskeleton, right? So, so that's another advantage. I'm already giving you out answers. So now you're looking at dragonfly exuvia. What does an exuvia mean? Can someone tell me what is an exuvia is? Exuvia is actually, remember dragonflies, insects have met, undergo metamorphosis. They have a larvae, sexually mature, and the sexually mature form is an adult, right? So when dragonflies metamorph, the metamorphosis happens inside this exuvia. They create a, uh, they actually create a pupal casing, they pupate, right? And the pupae looks like that right? The pupa or pupae looks like that. So lots of transformation, you know, between the adult and the larval stage um, happens inside that pupil stage. And the pupal casing is what we call exuvia. You get exuvias in butterflies, in moths, in many other insects that undergo complete metamorphosis, you get this casing, exuvia, right? Um, 
And in fact, um, when the adult emerges from the exuvia, the exuvia is left intact. It's kind of, kind of the, um, and, and, and then again, when adults undergo repeated growth, right? I, I mentioned they have to mold. This is what they mold, right? They mold, whatever they leave behind, the oldest skeleton they leave behind is also exuvia, right? So, um, and because exuvia is the exoskeleton, outside, externally, an exuvia looks exactly like an adult. External, inside it's hollow because the adult has left, right? Outside it looks exactly like an adult, right? And then of course I provided a couple of examples for exuvia. You can clearly see the animal has emerged. That's why it is hollow, right? Um, and then a couple of questions, right? Um, list three features that define class insecta that are evident in the dragonfly mold, right? If you look at this exuvia slash mold slash abandoned skin, <laughs> um, can someone tell me one character that I listed as an insect feature that is also observed in here? How many legs would you expect in an insect? How many pairs of legs? Six. Uh, three legs or three pairs, right? Three pairs of legs or six total legs. And how many legs can you see in this guy? One, two, three, right? Four, five, six. So that's actually one character. What do you think these are? That one and that one. What are those? Eyes. Compound eyes, right? Compound eyes. So that's another character you find in insects and in these guys, right? Two characters, uh, two answers to this question, right? Um, list three features of py phylum arthropoda that are evident on the mold or that are not evident on the mold, right? So let's talk about a character that is evident that you can directly see in the mold um, that is common to all arthropods. What, we, what would be the number one that you can scream? having an exoskeleton, right? You are looking at an exoskeleton, right? So presence of a uh, exoskeleton surrounding the body could be actually one answer, right? Another one is actually look at these legs. They are jointed. Having jointed appendage is another answer. So there you go, two answers to your next question, right? So those answers goes into your lab notebook, right? Um, and then actually the last but not the least, make sure for both crayfish and ascaris and just ascaris and crayfish only, you list everything A through G. It, that actually goes into your lab notebook as well. Um, well, that concludes the lab activity. It's a pretty easy activity to do. When you go on, if you get, if you were to stuck on something, just write down where you stuck on and then, you know, let's communicate through email. Let's uh, meet during my uh, Q&A session on Tuesdays um, or, um, or outside those or just through email, we can ask. It's very easy to help you when you drop in, you know, like come by in person um, through the office hours. Um, but I'm not opposed to answering a short uh, question through email. I try to respond to email immediately. Um, if I'm not in the field or if I'm not in my lab, um, I usually respond to your emails very immediately. Any questions regarding the lab activity before we go to the final part that is the homework component? Uh, very good. <sighs> All right, so let's quickly go over the homework part, shall we, guys, right? Again, stop me if you have any questions. And it's just one o'clock, we have 45 minutes left, um, but I'm not going to take all the 45 minutes, like I promise you. Um, so um, first, what you're going to do is you are going to write between crayfishes and Ascaris how you describe each of these points, right? Scientific name, right? Well, just copy and paste the scientific names. I have already given the scientific names in my uh, um, intro PowerPoint. Oh, no, not the intro, the, not the background PowerPoint, the exercise PowerPoint has the scientific names, right? Include both of them, right? Remember if you are typing, italize them, but if you are handwriting, don't handwrite type, right? If you are handwriting, underline, but if you are typing, italize. Don't underline if you are typing them. Phylum, again, you can steal it from my PowerPoint presentations. 
Remember, crayfish has a phylum, arthropoda, and a subphylum. Can someone tell me their subphylum out of their memory? Station. Very good, Crustacea. Excellent. Ascaris phylum. Can someone shout that at me? Start with letter N. Nematoda. Nematoda. Very good. Um, and the feeding type, right? How do they feed? Um, so in here, feel free to add a shorter description for Ascaris. Uh, remember, it's not all nematodes, Ascaris. Parasitic, right? You can say endoparasitic there because they actually live on your gut, right? Um, and for the crayfish, feeding type. Anyone wants to tell me what is their feeding type? What are crayfishes, right? We are looking at um, what is the southern crayfish, the big red one. Well, how do you think they feed? They're not parasites for sure, right? Heterophobic, heterotrophic. Yeah, so heterotrophic is good, not good enough. What specifically and how specifically do you think they feed? How do crayfish eat anyways? Through the mandible. Um, not asking with what, like what do they eat? Are they um eating plant parts? Are they eating other animals? They scavengers. Very good. They are scavengers. They are. They have two types of feeding. One is scavenging, eating dead organic matter. Right. That is that's what scavenging is. Another one is they can also be predators. They can actively hunt and eat small stuff like other invertebrates. So just mentioning predatory is enough. Scavenging is enough, right? You, you don't have to go as far as mentioning like they eat small stuff. No, predator is fine. Um, and then structures and organs in the digestive system. This is another place where you guys unfortunately lose all your point, you know, some of your points. Start from the mouth if they have a mouth, then list everything after the mouth, right? Do they have mouth? Yeah, right mouth. Uh, well, what should come next? Go back to your dissection PowerPoints, right? Esophagus, do they have a stomach? Uh, how many different stomachs do they have? Pyloric, cardiac, right? And then like that, go through all the steps of the digestive system, right? And then write it down there, right? Um, this, so so um, mostly students lose points, not all points, few points, because they actually forget to include some of them. Um, and then structures used for locomotion. Right. Um, now, this is again a point that I want you to think big. Right. What do they use for locomotion? Well, a crayfish, of course, you are going, you, are, you will not forget the walking legs. You will not forget the swimming legs, but you might forget the tail. Right. So don't forget to mention the tail. Right. And also, they also use, remember, the tail is part of the abdomen, the last part of abdomen. You can also write abdomen, which also kind of contracts or kind of shakes to create the swimming force. Right. And for Ascaris, you can mention two things that help them with locomotion. Can someone tell me what those locomo those stuff are? Two things that you can mention? Pseudocyl. Very good, pseudocelom. Another one? The muscles. Yeah, and you can be specific. What type of muscles? Longitudinal, well, yeah, no. longitudinal muscles. And also, how do they move? Well, you can say trashing, but I don't think I'm asking how they may move. I'm asking structures for movement, right? And for uh, attachment. Um, so you can also include cuticle over there because I say attachment. Um, and structures for maintaining body shape. Well, how do crayfish maintain their body shape? With what? The exoskeleton. Very good, excellent exoskeleton. And Ascaris maintains their body shape. They use two things, I'll give you a hint. First. Do they have a cuticle? Correct, they do. Next one. Pseudocelum. Excellent. Or you can also call, say hydrostatic skeleton, but I, I, I don't care which, which you call it. Hydrostatic skeleton is the pseudocelum, right? Um, and then, are they diploblastic or triploblastic? They have three germinal layers. That's how I started. So what are they? 
Triploblastic. Very good. Both of them are triploblastic. Deuterostome or protostome? And I very first started and mentioned wh what they are. Mouth first or anus first? The protosome. Protostome. Protostome. Mouth first. Correct. Structures and organs of reproduction. Then uh, this is again a point that where you need to think broadly, right? Um, for example, when it comes to crayfish, um, you might forget to mention the male swimmerets, right? The claspers, right? Or the gonopods, right? And for females, also don't forget to mention swimmerets because they use swimmerets to hold the eggs, right? And usually you don't forget gonads, right? I have never seen a student forgetting that, but you might forget other accessory structures in the reproductive system, right? And then in terms of ascaris, well, um, well, again, testes and ovary, right? For female, you can actually mention all the others. I mentioned three organs, right? Ovary, think about the, the order. Ovaries produce eggs and that or eggs are transported with what? The duct that transports eggs? Oviduct. Oviduct, correct. And that, where do they store eggs? Uterus. Uterus. See, those are the three organs that you need to think about, right? And males, oh, uh, they produce sperms in testes and what takes those, uh, and, and then there's a duct that transports sperms. Vast difference. Vast differences and the sperms are stored in. Starting with S. Ending with vesicles. Seminal vesicles. Seminal or seminal vesicles, right? Correct. See, how we see is this? Sexes, do they have separate male and female? Or do they have both female and male reproductive system in the same individual? Separate or together? Separate. Always separate, right? For both of them, it's separate, right? Um, fertilization. Are they internal or external? Now, how do you know? Like, how do you remember all of this crap? Well, did Ascaris males have some stuff that actually helped them to inject sperm into the female? They did, right? Remember those the cirri at the end? Those are for injecting sperms, right? So if they have st structures to e eject or inject, sperms, you are looking at evidence for internal fertilization, right? Now for crayfish, did crayfish male have something to inject sperms into the female? They did. So both of them undergo internal fertilization. That's actually how you remember things, right? Remember one thing and use whatever you memorized into connect to other stuff. Um, circulation. Well, that is easy. Did Ascaris have circulation at, at all? They did not. So no, none. For crayfish, was it internal or external? Sorry, was it uh, open or closed? My bad. For the crayfish? Open. Very good. It's open. Um, well, and then the circulatory structures. There's none for Ascaris. And then, of course, again, go through what kind of circulatory organs did you see? You, you already saw the heart. Right, and there, if there's a heart, there should be blood vessels. So you can actually automatically remember vessels, right? And then remember the space that hemolymph accumulates, blood accumulates, right? Which is actually the hemocell, right? And then what connects heart with the hemocell? That is actually um, the holes on the top of the heart, ostia, right? And ostia is a term that is that you will read in your lab manual, and it's marked in my PowerPoint presentation as well. So that's actually sort of assisting you to go through the uh, homework. Here's a couple of questions before we uh, close today's lab activity. First one, um, you don't have to straight up answer if you are more comfortable with emailing me separately. Do you find it easy if we keep meeting synchronously for the first half of the lab, let you ask questions, answer questions, and have at least, you know, um, see your professor and see your friends. Do you like that part? Or would you rather that I record everything first and upload and stay away and make it entirely asynchronous? Uh, you can shout out now. Um, synchronous, do you want to shout out? Synchronous. I'd prefer synchronous. I definitely don't mind it like this. I definitely prefer it this way. It seems like many of you who, at least everybody who spoke up said synchronous. Anyone who, who says, Asynchronous. Anyone want to say that? 
Okay, synchronicity is right. So again, unless like something happens to me that 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 that, that I completely yeah, I don't know you know <laughs> blew a part of my brain. Uh, let's do things synchronously, right? I was planning to do certain lab asynchronous, but I'm unless you know like something bad happens, everything will be synchronous from this point onwards, right? Um, question number two. I like going over the home, homework just to like, you know, push you towards the right direction. Do you think that I should save time for you guys and not go over the homework? Uh, or uh, should I do what I did today in, in, in future weeks and go over the homework? What do you think? Go over? So yes or no? Yes, go over. No, don't bother. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Okay. That's actually, yeah, a lot of yeses. I, Honestly, I've never heard students saying don't go. It's like one to nine usually. <laughs> um, that's it, my friends. Um, now, always do not forget to update your lab notebook as we go, right? Um, homework due next week. Um, and start working on your group assignments. Ask questions as they come up. Um, yeah, go on, go, go. I may have some questions about the lab, how the lab notebook works as I'm working on it. Yeah, so I'm going to actually, first, I'm going to ask um, you guys if you have any questions regarding the lab homework due tonight, and then I'm going to let Emily ask her question. Any questions regarding the homework? Oh, I, don't, I, don't, I don't have any questions right now. I'm just saying that as I'm working on it, I'm probably going to run into questions. Oh, 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 that's fine. That's completely fine. No, no, no. If you have a question, you know what to do. Email me. If it's a longer question, let's set up a meeting. And you guys know my office hours, right? I have two open office hours for Tuesdays. If you cannot make them, for example, um, like if you're in my lecture, things are easy because that is my lecture hours. You can drop in, all right? If, if the time is available, you can drop in. If not, we can talk about an alternative time. Now, any question regarding the homework due tonight? I have a few questions, but that's just because I missed the first um, meeting. Believe me, Kayla, your friends will not be pissed if you ask the questions. So others, guys, if you don't have questions, you can leave. Um, anyone who has questions regarding the homework or want to hang around until, you know, whatever Kayla asks, hang around. Emily, my, I, I, it seems like you don't have a question right now. You might have questions down the road. Completely fine. But um, yeah, so leave if you don't have any questions. But I will, uh, I'm going to ask uh, Kayla to start shouting questions at me. Okay. I think I'm good on my end. Thank you very much and have a great day. You too, Jared. Thank you. Have a good one. Bye-bye, yeah, James. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Okay. All right, Kayla, it's us. <laughs> I'll start with uh, my questions for the first lab, like exercise. Uh -huh. um, so for that lab, I looked over everything. Is all of like the material that I'm sort of working on that all goes into my lab notebook? That's a great question. So most of the stuff that you work on as you read the lab handout, yes, right? Mm -hmm. um, but remember that a lot of stuff that actually you work on, so you you you, you saw the homework assignment, yeah. this one, right? Yeah. So first, fill as much as possible over here, right? Since we don't have like a lab manual page for that, right? The lab manual doesn't have an evolutionary tree um, handout. So this is, the, this is the homework part. So in the handout, if there is something that I ask you to do, but it does not go into this homework sheet, yes, you include that in your homework sheet, uh, in your lab notebook, right? Okay. Uh, but most of the stuff, Kayla, is going to go in here. Okay, right? just on the homework. Yeah. Then okay. all everything else that actually, because like when you read it, you understand it says in home worksheet, right? Yeah. If I say in character matrix, in phylogenetic tree, then you know where to look at, right? So mm -hmm. if most of them will come over here. And then after that, there are some, some questions that is not repeated in the handout that comes up over there. Mm -hmm. right? right? So yeah, that's actually how you do it. So it's going to be 50, it's going to be like mostly filling up the trees Mm -hmm. homework some of them will go into um lab notebook yeah so for this first one the first lab um i remember there was sort of like pre-lab questions is that basically the only thing that's going to be in my lab notebook for this one that's also a very good question so for this one like not the one on my screen the one we finished today so when you like remember in my email i'm going to ask always 
read the uh, uh, um, manual, right? Read the chapter in the manual. And then there is going to be some pre-lab questions. So mm -hmm. those answers to these pre-lab questions, answers to the pre-lab activities will go into lab notebook under the specific section called like net lab notes, right? For that particular activity. Yeah. Yes. So that's where you include answers to all of that activities. And then remember when you, that's pre-lab, when you go on the lab, it asks certain questions that this particular structure on that thing, the, this particular structure doing that function, right? That kind of questions, the answers to those all, all again goes to the same section in the lab notebook, right? Okay. And honestly, from today's lab and onwards, the homework is happens at the very end, right? Do the homework after you complete all the lab exercises. The reason okay. is, A, it's in, sort of, um, you don't have to switch back and forth. We, we intentionally make it independent. Once you finish it, you already have the answers. Right, right, okay. Yeah, you already um, have the answers. So, um, yeah, go on. Okay, so for now the lab exercises and the homework, we I we all we each do it individually. Like we're not doing any group work. Good question, Kella. So what I again advise is, um, I want you to submit um, the homework individually, right? Mm -hmm. I want you to keep your own independent lab notebook that I will grade at the end of each practical, right? Um, so, but does that prevent you from working together? No, not at all. Mm -hmm. I'm right. not go yeah, you can actually definitely um, work with other friends in your, like the, the team that you work with, right? If you like yeah. working with them, if, if they actually, if that is something you enjoy doing, absolutely, right? Um, mm -hmm. That's completely fine, right? But still, uh, even, even so, make sure you submit your own answer, right? Right, okay. Uh, yeah, that's actually... Um, the way you do it. Like my experience, students do it both ways. Yeah. Okay. Um, now for this homework sheet you have on the screen, um, for this first table right here, um, I didn't dive into the, all the info like deeply, but I did breeze through um, these three boxes, those three top boxes. So it's like the cell wall material and then storage molecule. Am I supposed to be making more of those with other characteristics and then to do the similarities between them? Okay. You, you got it 100% correct. What you are going to do is you are going to come up with three additional characters with different mm -hmm. character states that help you to separate the species right. in your box, right? Remember there are box A and box B in on Blackboard. So you pick whatever A or B you need. Earlier what we did is we actually did that in class virtually yeah. right so you pick a or b just and then one. yeah just okay. pick one box right don't go for bo both boxes that's that's that, that will be extremely confusing pick okay, one yeah. box yeah and then cross out the species that does not belong to your box this has so many species because it contains species from both boxes right so okay. cross out things that is not related to you and in, and and include and come up with characters if you need help with come up with characters look at my powerpoint presentation it goes over certain characters for mm -hmm. all the species in yeah. both boxes right mm -hmm. um and then and then of course once you have those characters you can actually start creating the phylogenetic tree my now two things that i emphasized a lot um, during the virtual session, you yourself will produce like five different um, phylogenetic trees, right? Do not worry about thinking what is most accurate, okay. right? I just need one. I'm not going to penalize for another student coming up with a better phylogenetic trend. I, I'm not even going to compare, honestly, right? Okay. I'm just going to make sure that whether you are accurately, correctly using the characters and character states. That's the only thing I worry about, right? Okay. Um, think about home place, but don't kill yourself because you cannot sometimes determine like what is, you know, whether a particular character is home place or not. Okay. Unless I give you molecular evidence, which I don't. So, and also the second advice is split. Try to split like one from the rest, right? You know, like, you know, you have five yeah. species, separate one from the rest. What character is ideal to separate one from the rest? And then again, you have three, four left. 
separate one from three, right? Or, you know, like that, like that, you know, try to minimize, try to separate like that. Sometimes it works. Sometimes you will end up uh, separating two, two, like after the first one is out. It's so sometimes you might go by two by two, right? Huh. Um, that, that's also fine. But I, I find it myself easy to pick a character that throws one out and helps me to keep the rest. So, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, I think that's all my questions. So for stuff that I'm like submitting, it's just going to be the homeworks. And then I just keep up with my lab notebook and then you do checks. That's correct. So I do two official checks and I have also mentioned in the lab schedule um, when those are, it's on the day of the exam. Okay. So what yeah. I mentioned to the rest of the class, which is not clear by reading the syllabus, is that I accept both physical um, notebooks right, where you actually compositional style notebook, you write everything as if you were in the lab. That's fine too. The other way is actually to um, create an electronic one, right? Yeah. For example, a OneNote is actually what most students, once one of the, our students actually came up with that idea, OneNote, I could not agree more. Mm -hmm. Word document is fine, but OneNote is easier to keep everything. So electronically, that's fine if you keep it. You just upload the, the final, um, before a particular practical, whatever you have, you upload that file, that entire file, uh, OneNote file or Word document, right? If yeah. you like, I mean, um, so for example, you have like a tablet, right? Or you take notes, you know, you actually hand draw on the tablet. That might be a good way to do because there's a lot of drawings going on. Mm -hmm. But if you, uh, an, if you keep a physical notebook, then you, what you're going to do is um, you take photograph from your notebook from your phone or from your tablet. And then I uploaded a couple of uh, apps um, or yeah. mechanisms to merge different PDFs, uh, 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 different uh, photographs together. So yeah, I'll probably end up doing the physical notebook just because there's so I hate online so much. Really? Like, yes. If I don't know why, but like, it's very hard for me to, to like grasp information online, like even meeting dates, like everything. Like if this class was in person, I would not have missed the first class. So it's like, it's just like, oh, like I'm just trying. <laughs> so yeah, you're, you're the kind of a gal who keeps like an actual diary and actual schedule. Yeah, I write down everything and yeah, but um, this definitely helps. Thank you for going over everything. Um, I, the all the previous information from the first class in lab, I've been through all of it. Um, so I'll just have to, do that homework, which I have a, I have a really good idea of how to do the homework anyways, but I wanted to check with you before I actually started doing it and then did it wrong. Um, so yeah. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, I, it's fine. Like I, that's why I actually have the dual, um, option, right? I mean, if you like doing it, um, um, hard copy and scan it, it's not that hard. Mm -hmm. Um, um, it's simply, you know, you take the photograph and then ultimately make sure you properly bundle the different photograph, right? Convert them into PDF and then merge all the PDFs. It's not that hard. Um, if you struggle at that point, we can talk about how to do it. And I don't know whether it's also productive to keep like everything like you write electronically and then after the fact, connect handwritten drawings to OneNote. I don't... I. Seems like that's too much work, but yeah. seems like you prefer to keep everything on hard copy. Right, so I don't have to worry about that. <laughs> yeah, no, um, no. The only other thing I want to mention about the lab you missed, um, try to watch the video and try to skipping it because it's two hours long. <laughs> yeah, I actually, um, I this morning, probably like an hour and a half before this lab started, I clicked it to watch it and I was like, oh shoot, it's two hours long. So I sped it up a little bit. So I briefly went through it, but I'm going to watch it in through its entirety later anyways, yeah. but yeah. And, and some parts you are going to skip because parts that actually they are, we do the group out, breakout, eh, I don't know whether you want to watch that. Oh, okay. Libus overview, eh, you can skip that. So like that, keep skipping. But um, yeah, it's, uh, I, I cannot manually break it up because we record it as we speak. Right, right. <laughs> so that's why it's one long thing. But yeah. anyways, I'm glad you made it and it seems like you caught up everything, so. No, oh, yeah, yeah, I really made sure to because when I saw that the class happened, I panicked because I just 